for those who may not be familiar with THGA, they are the state's housing finance agency, and they administer ad affordable single and multifamily rental housing programs across the state. So programs such as the Great Choice Program, which funds fixed rate mortgage loans for first time home buyers. In 2019, THDA made home ownership possible for more than 4,500 Tennesseans through Great Choice. Almost 500 of these loans were closed in Shelby County with African-American families representing 62% of the buyers. However, THDA knows that we still have work to do to promote fair, equitable housing opportunities for all Tennesseans. To that end, THDA recently worked with other state housing agencies to complete an analysis into the impediments to fair housing choice across the state. This analysis resulted in the development of a fair housing plan with actions that address those impediments over the next five years. Included as one of the action steps in this fair housing plan is the new Convergence Memphis program, a partnership between THDA and the National Mortgage Bankers Association to work towards closing the gap in home ownership among minority households in the Memphis area. Further, over the next few weeks, THDA will begin publishing a series of research briefs that examine fair housing trends and target specific fair housing issues in Tennessee, such as racial and ethnic disparities in home mortgage originations. While these briefs offer a statewide perspective and the findings are not sp specific to any particular region, THDA hopes they will complement the local research and encourage a better understanding of fair housing issues across the state. It is appropriate THDA leads this session off as during the 50th anniversary of the Fair Housing Act, THDA staff was afforded an opportunity to participate in the THDA Fair Housing Book Club led by Ms. Charity Williams and Laura Swanson. Included in our readings was The Color of Law. The Color of Law was an eye-opening experience for everyone who participated from THDA. It provided staff with education that was impactful to how THDA approaches the work that they do, both internally and externally within the agency, as well as in their personal lives. While it generated emotions for some, it allowed all who participated a better understanding of housing segregation, highlighted some of the continued practices and the effects of those actions or inactions within our own communities. Staff walked away with a better understanding of disparities and barriers that may impact the individuals and families that we serve. THDA is honored that as an organization, they've made an effort to voluntarily introduce employees across the state to the historical accounts and alternative perspectives surrounding housing opportunities in the United States, as well as further our commitment to continue to provide safe, affordable, and equitable housing to all Tennesseans. Uh, THDA offers thanks to the city of Memphis for uh, coordinating uh, this session in collaboration today. Uh, and they're certainly honored to co-host this session. Um, and hopefully it will leave all of the participants with some insightful information uh, similar to the, the impact that it had on THDA staff. Um, we're now going to turn it over to the session's moderator, who many of you know well, um, Ms. Terry Freeman, the executive director of the National Civil Rights Museum here in Memphis, as she introduces our keynote speaker and leads us through our lunch conversation on systemic racism and Memphis neighborhoods. Thank you, Paul. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here uh, with you. My introduction of our um, keynote is going to be brief because I think what we're most interested in is the content of um, this incredible book that um, Mr. Richard Rothstein uh, wrote to actually chronicle um, the history of segregation, segregated housing in our country. So let me just ask that um, our author, Richard Rothstein of The Color of Law, um, join our program. Thank you very Hi, much. How are you? I am fine, thanks. It's a pleasure to be here with you today, or at least virtually. I wish I could be in Memphis, but uh, maybe uh, someday this, this emergency will end. <laughs> 
Exactly, exactly. Well, I want to jump right in. Um, I have a series of questions, but I want you to take this in the direction you would want to take this. Um, and first of all, let me just show for everyone. This is the book that we're speaking of, The Color of Law. Um, I will tell you that it was about, oh, I don't know, a year or so ago uh, when I was speaking to someone and they said, you have to read this book, The Color of Law. They said, it changed my entire perspective on how our communities are constructed. Um, so I ran out and I got the book and I happened to talk to my oldest daughter and I said, oh, I've got this great book that you need to read. It's The Color of Law. She said, oh, I read that years ago. So um, I was late to the party, uh, but I will say that it was a fascinating read and I have told everyone um, that they have to read the book. So for those of you who are watching, if you have not read The Color of Law, I implore you to get the book um, and read it because trust me, you are going to learn quite a bit. So Richard, why did you decide to write this, this book? I'm curious. Well, I spent much of my time as an education writer. Uh, I had an education column in the New York Times for a while. I did education writing uh, for the Economic Policy Institute, the, the research institute to the, which I was affiliated. I really knew nothing about housing, but I came to understand that uh, housing segregation was the biggest problem that public schools face in this country today. Because when so many children uh, from low income, disproportionately African-American neighborhoods come to school with serious social and economic disadvantages, uh, the schools cannot possibly overcome those disadvantages and uh, achievement is low. So if, if I can take a minute, I can give you an example. Sure. I remember writing one column about asthma as you may know, African-American children in urban low-income neighborhoods uh, have asthma at an average rate that's four times as high as the rate of white children's asthma. And if a child has, and they have asthma, let me say, because uh, they live in more polluted neighborhoods, more diesel trucks driving through their neighborhoods, more dilapidated buildings, more vermin in the environment, uh, more uh, empty lots uh, kicking up dust. And if a child has asthma, that child is uh, more likely than a child who doesn't to come to school drowsy the next day because the child's been up at night wheezing. Mm -hmm. And if you have two groups of children who are identical in every respect, except one group is a higher rate of asthma, that group's gonna have lower average achievement. Mm -hmm. And you know, we can pass all the laws we want. We, we passed one in 2001 called the No Child Left Behind Act, which said that the only reason that uh, African-American achieve at lower levels than white children is, is because uh, teachers have low expectations of them. I thought that was nonsense. It's uh, true, some teachers are bigoted and have low expectations, but the reason that uh, children, uh, uh, African-American children in particular, achieve lower is because of these social and economic disadvantages. I mean, if a child has asthma is coming to school drowsy the next day, no matter how many laws we pass trying to hold teachers accountable for those children's achievement, that child is not going to achieve as well as a child who's come to school well rested. Mm -hmm. And you can go through example after example of this. So it's asthma, lead poisoning. It has a measurable impact on children's IQ, uh, homelessness, economic insecurity. If you add all these up, uh, they um, pretty much explain the achievement gap. Uh, there's not much left for teacher bigotry to, to explain. And then I realized that, um, you know, it's one thing if a child has asthma or lead poisoning or homelessness or economic insecurity. What happens if you have a school where every child has one or more of these conditions? Well, we call schools where we concentrate schools, uh, ch children with uh, those kinds of problems. We call them segregated schools. And the schools today in this country are more segregated than they ever have been in the last 45 years. And the reason they're more segregated is because the neighborhoods in which they're located are segregated. So I began to be, understand that neighborhood segregation was a school problem. That's how I came to this topic. Mm -hmm. Well, it is truly fascinating. And I think you are already touching on how interconnected housing is to basically everything that um, impacts us as we move through our days in community. And I wanna get back to that in a few minutes, but I wanna go through a little bit of the book because I do think the history is really, really important. This idea of de facto segregation in housing has been the prevailing narrative, you know, we that we actually choose to segregate. Your book makes it plain that de jure segregation was the issue at play. 
Um, as we look at systemic racism in general, what role has housing played in the equation of systemic um, uh, racism? And talk a little bit about de jure segregation versus de facto segregation. Well, sure. And then maybe I'll come back to, to um, the connection with education because it's all, it all ties in together, as you say. We have a national myth. Uh, the myth is that uh, the reason that uh, we have segregated neighborhoods, and I've lived in many uh, metropolitan areas, uh, every one that I've ever lived in had clearly defined areas that were all white or mostly white, clearly defined areas that were all black or mostly black. Um, we tell ourselves that the reason this is true is because of private actions, uh, not government. Uh, you know, in the 20th century, we had a civil rights movement that uh, abolished segregation and everything from lunch counters to buses to water fountains. You know that history, schools, uh, legal segregation in schools or colleges and universities. All of those were created by government, uh, by law, by regulation, by uh, 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 policy uh, that was created by government. It was unconstitutional. If the federal government was creating these uh, policies of segregation, it was a violation of the Fifth Amendment a civil rights um, violation that we're obligated to remedy. If state and local governments were doing it, it was a violation of the 14th Amendment. We're also obligated to remedy that. But we tell ourselves that the segregation of the neighborhoods didn't happen that way. It wasn't government. We say it happened by accident, uh, naturally, because of uh, bigoted homeowners or landlords who uh, uh, wouldn't rent or sell to African-Americans in white neighborhoods, or maybe because um, oh, people just like to live with each other of the same race. We feel more comfortable that way. Or maybe because of uh, businesses in the private economy, not government, but um, real estate agencies and banks and developers, they discriminated. Or maybe you say it's all just the result of income differences. Uh, many African-Americans can't afford to move to white middle class. All of these individual, personal, um, uh, bigoted decisions, but not government, is what created residential segregation. What happened by accident uh, can only unhappen by accident. And uh, we give a name to it, as you know, it's uh, called de facto segregation. And uh, we say if it was de facto segregation that wasn't created by government, not a civil rights violation, government is um, uh, not permitted to do anything about it. It has to unhappen naturally. Well, if I may, uh, let me come back to what I was talking about before, because uh, because of my interest in education, I read a, um, a Supreme Court decision in 2007 that uh, evaluated two school districts, uh, Louisville, Kentucky, and Seattle, Washington, uh, both of which uh, were uh, trying in a very trivial way to um, desegregate their schools. And um, they gave the choice of which school their uh, uh, child would attend. But if the choice was going to exacerbate segregation, that wouldn't be honored in favor of the choice of a parent who wouldn't. So if you had an all white school or mostly white school and uh, one place left and both a black and a white child applied for that last place, the black child would be given some preference to help to desegregate the school. This was a trivial program. Uh, how often do you have one place left to the school and both a black and a white child apply for it? But the Supreme Court denounced this program, said you couldn't do such a thing. Uh, the, the, the opinion was written by Chief Justice John Roberts he said that um, it's true the schools in Louisville and Seattle are segregated, but he said they're segregated because the neighborhoods in which they're located are segregated. And then he went through an example, an, an, an uh, explanation of how those neighborhoods came to be segregated. He said it was because of private bigotry of landlords and homeowners and private businesses and people liking to live with each other and um, income differences. Government had nothing to do with it. He said this is de facto segregation. And if you have de facto segregation, Government is prohibited from doing something to fix something that government didn't create. Well, I read this decision, and as uh, I said, it, it involved the school districts of Louisville, Kentucky, and Seattle, Washington. And I remembered uh, reading about something that happened in Louisville, Kentucky, one of those uh, districts some years before. There was a white homeowner in a single-family home in an all-white suburb of Louisville called Shively. Uh, the white homeowner had an African-American friend living in downtown Louisville, renting an apartment. He had a wife and a child. He was a decorated Navy veteran, wanted to move to a single family home. No one was selling one. So the white homeowner sold, a, bought another home in his community and resold it to his African-American friend. And when the African-American friend moved in, an angry white mob 
surrounded the, the home, protected by the police. This is the key point, protected by the police. They threw rocks through the windows and the police made no effort to stop it. They dynamited and firebombed the home and the police made no effort to stop it. But when this riot was all over, the state of Kentucky arrested, tried, convicted, and jailed with a 15-year sentence, the white homeowner for sedition, for having sold a, a home in a white neighborhood to a black family. And so I said to myself, this doesn't sound to me much like de facto segregation. If the police, the courts, the prosecutors are all mobilized to enforce racial segregation in the Louisville metropolitan area. And when I looked into it further, I found there were hundreds and hundreds of cases in communities all over the country, Memphis, New York, Chicago, Detroit, Los Angeles, San Francisco, anyone you can name, where police protected, sometimes police led and police organized violence, drove African Americans out of homes that they had legitimately purchased in, in previously white neighborhoods. Every one of these cases where the police in, were involved was a civil rights violation, a violation of the Constitution, gave the lie to the notion of de facto segregation. And I looked into it further and I found that there were many, many other policies of the federal, state, and local governments, all explicitly racial, all explicitly designed to um, ensure that blacks and whites could not live near one another in okay. any metropolitan area of the country. And that's what led to my writing this book. Yeah, I, I think that the, what you just mentioned, <clears throat> the issue of the kind of the um, government sanctioned uh, uh, segregation in housing and police protection of those who were actually attacking people who, for whatever reason, um, <clears throat> were trying to move into a neighborhood or had sold uh, a house to uh, a black couple in a neighborhood. It has some bearing on what we are seeing today. And I think it's really important for people to understand. That's why this history um, is so critical for us to understand, to be able to move forward, which is what we do here at the National Civil Rights Museum. I, I wanted you to talk a little bit about some of the tactics they use because we often find ourselves telling um, guests as we're talking with them about some of the issues around redlining and housing that often you can get your deed, you can look in your deed and you can see some of the history historic, some of the remnants of what you are speaking of. Could you talk a little bit about the tactics uh, that were used during uh, these years? Sure. Let me talk about one policy of the mid 20th century that I think uh, uh, you can see has a very, very powerful uh, impact on what we have today in this country. In the post-World War II period, uh, the federal government, particularly the Federal Housing Administration and Veterans Administration, embarked on a racially explicit plan to move uh, all white working class and lower middle class families out of urban areas where they were then living, we weren't a suburban country yet, into single family homes in all white suburbs, like that Shively one in Louisville that I described a few minutes ago. It was a racially explicit plan. And these uh, suburbs that the Federal Housing Administration created existed everywhere in the country, in Memphis, and in, as I say, you can go through all the cities I named before. The Federal Housing Administration created a white noose of all white suburbs around urban areas. Well, the developers, I, I, I don't uh, know specifically about Memphis, but as you say, you can look in a deed in Memphis and you can find uh, this history. Um, the, the most famous of these, and maybe you've heard of it, was Levittown, east of New York City. Uh, 17,000 homes in one place, uh, but they're all over the country. Uh, some are just about as large, uh, 15,000 homes uh, uh, in many places and smaller ones as well. The developer of that particular one, Levittown, William Levitt, could never have assembled the capital to build 17,000 homes in one place to buy the land for them and build the homes on his own. Uh, no bank would be crazy enough to lend him the money. They thought this was a crazy idea. As I said, we weren't a suburban country at that time. The only way that Levitt could get the capital to buy the land and build these homes was by going to the Federal Housing Administration and Veterans Administration, uh, giving them his plans for the development, the architectural design of the homes, the construction materials he's going to use, great detail, the layout of the streets, and the Federal Housing Administration and Veterans Administration required him to make a commitment never to sell a home to an African-American. They even required that Levitt put 
in the deeds of the homes of what you just described, a clause in the deeds prohibiting resale to African-Americans or rental to African-Americans. This was a federal requirement. And on this basis, um, he was able to go to a bank, get a federally guaranteed bank loan and uh, build that uh, suburb. And these suburbs were built, uh, these developments were built to create a white noose around every metropolitan area of this country. Well, those homes uh, that uh, Levitt built, uh, uh, let me say it was not uh, this requirement, uh, was not the action of rogue bureaucrats in the um, Federal Housing Administration. This was written out in the federal policy manuals, a written federal policy, uh, a manual that was distributed to appraisers all over the country, whose job it was to review applications of builders, um, Memphis everywhere, uh, for federally guaranteed bank loans. The manual said you could not recommend for a federal bank guarantee a project that was going to uh, be integrated. You couldn't even recommend for a federal bank guarantee an all-white development that was going to be located near where African-Americans were living. Because in the words of the manual, and I'm quoting, that would run the risk of infiltration by inharmonious racial groups. That's what the federal manual said. In my book, The Color of Law, I have a photograph of a six foot high, half mile long concrete wall. The developer was required by the Federal Housing Administration to construct to separate his development from a nearby African-American neighborhood as a condition of getting a federal bank guarantee for his loan. And this was done all over the country. Uh, as I say, this notion of de facto segregation is other nonsense. Uh, without this federal policy, we would not have white suburbs and inner city uh, black neighborhoods. Well, uh, the, these homes at the time were very inexpensive. In the post-World War II period, they were mainly for returning war veterans, although for others as well. They sold at the time for seven, eight, nine thousand dollars a piece. Well, in today's money, it's it, what's well, not that cheap. In today's money, that's about a hundred thousand dollars. But those homes no longer sell for a hundred thousand dollars today. Uh, they sell for in in Levittown, the example I just gave you. They sell for three hundred, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars. Some places, they sell for a million dollars or more. Wow. The the white families. Working class families, returning war veterans, they had jobs in the post-war economy. Any working class family, black or white, could have afforded to buy a home for $100,000 a piece. That's twice national median income. That's far below what the uh, uh, African-Americans with jobs in, in, the, in the economy can afford, and whites as well. The whites who bought those homes, though, gained over the next, next couple of generations wealth from the appreciation and the value of their homes, uh, equity. Uh, most families in this country who have any wealth get it from the equity they have in their homes. Uh, and uh, so the white families gained this wealth over the next couple of generations. African-Americans prohibited, prohibited by federal policy from participating in this wealth generating program. The white families used this wealth to uh, send their children to college, use it to take care of emergencies, perhaps maybe medical emergencies, maybe temporary unemployment. You know, if you have wealth and you lose a job uh, while you're looking for a new one, you can dip into your wealth to maintain your standard of living. If you don't have wealth and you lose a job, you're pushed further down the economic scale permanently, perhaps. Mm -hmm. The white families used it to um, subsidize their retirements, and they used it to bequeath wealth to their children and grandchildren, who then had down payments for their own homes. Mm -hmm. African Americans, as I say, were prohibited, prohibited from from. Uh, accumulating this wealth by federal policy. The result is that today, African-American incomes are about 60% of white income, 60%. So there's a story behind that, that income gap. I don't have time to talk about it today, maybe some other time. But you know, there's a 60% uh, income ratio between uh, African-Americans and whites. You'd think that if there was a 60% income ratio, that African-American wealth would also be 60% of white wealth, that people can save the same amount of money from the same incomes. But the reality is that while African-Americans have incomes at 60% the white rate, African-American wealth is only 5% of white wealth. Mm -hmm. And that enormous disparity between a 60% income ratio and a 5% wealth ratio is entirely attributable to unconstitutional federal housing policy that was practiced in the mid-20th century, a violation of the Fifth Amendment as much as con unconstitutional as the segregation of lunch counters or buses or any of the things we addressed in the 20th century, as much of a civil rights violation, and we've never accepted an obligation, which we have as American citizens, to remedy it. 
Well, that wealth gap uh, is the major uh, contributor, a major contributor to the inequality that we have in this country today, racial inequality. It, uh, obviously, it prevents African-Americans from having down payments to move to more highly resourced neighborhoods where there are better jobs and more transportation to jobs and healthier air um, and access to, to supermarkets selling uh, fresh foods. Uh, but the wealth gap, uh, it, it goes uh, much farther because we concentrate African-Americans and uh, these uh, low-income neighborhoods that they cannot escape uh, because of this inequality. Uh, it creates not only the, the segregation of schools that I talked about before with the enormous problems that that results in for public education. It creates uh, health disparities between African-Americans and whites. African-Americans have uh, shorter life expectancies on average, greater rates of cardiovascular disease because um, they live in less healthy neighborhoods, um, more pollution, uh, more of those diesel trucks driving through. It predicts um, a, a good part of the cause of mass incarceration that uh, and, and police abuse of, of young African-American men. I'm not suggesting that the police <laughs> ever abuse uh, young African-American men if it weren't for segregation, but it makes it much, much more uh, uh, intense when we concentrate the most disadvantaged young men in single neighborhoods without access to jobs or transportation or uh, other attributes of a, a, of a better resource neighborhood. Uh, the police uh, uh, be, uh, uh, assume the stance of an occupying force uh, in those neighborhoods in much the same way that police in colonial countries did so, whether in India or the Congo, when you have a, a disadvantaged, a suppressed population, the police are controlling them. And uh, that's a good part of the reason why we have these problems. And let me say one other thing, and I, I know I'm giving you a long answer to a short question, but let me say one other thing, if I may, Terry. Um, you know, the, the wealth gap and the segregation that we have created in an unconstitutional fashion is in large part uh, responsible for the very, very frightening and dangerous political polarization that we have today and that we're very much aware of in these days, uh, how can we ever expect to develop um, the common national identity that we need to preserve this democracy if so many African-Americans and whites live so far from each other, mm -hmm. that we have no ability to understand each other, no ability to empathize with each other? How can we ever uh, develop a common national identity? Mm -hmm. And the result of that is that the entire country is impoverished, not just African-Americans. Uh, we have a uh, less adequate infrastructure in this country, less adequate health care, um, less adequate public education for everybody because of this political polarization that's so largely racially tinged. Uh -huh. So this is a problem that uh, we have a, a constitutional obligation to address, but it's also a problem that affects both whites and blacks, uh, uh, creating a much less uh, rich, uh, quality of life in this country than other industrial countries enjoy that don't have this kind of racial polarization. You know, many, um, many people, as you were talking about this wealth gap, um, I should note that a couple of years ago in 2018, <clears throat> when we commemorated the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Dr. King, we commissioned a study from the University of Memphis um, to talk about what's happened over these 50 years. And one of the things we found out with regard to income inequality was that over a 50 year period here in Memphis, African-Americans continue to make 50% of what white Americans make. So it's 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 ten percent greater, if you will, here with regard to the inequality. But with regard to the wealth gap, the other thing that's important about this um, the home ownership piece and the wealth piece is that many people take out loans against their home equity to help their students go to college and continue their education. When you don't have that. And, and you find yourself in a situation where you have to do exorbitant um, costs to student loans, that prohibits many young people from being able to further their education. So you're so right with regard to the impact that this has long term. One of the things that I found interesting in reading the book was that we often think of um, uh, president Roosevelt, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, as this incredible president who got us through, you know, the depression, created the New Deal. Um, <clears throat> and in reading your book, what I learned was that there were some policies that were created during the New Deal that were certainly um, not advantageous for um, 
uh, for black people in this country. And what it said to me was, <laughs> you can be a good person. That doesn't mean that you don't still contribute to systemic issues that have long-term ramifications. Can you talk a little bit about what the New Deal policies look like that have had a, a, a real impact, even though this was one of the this was the president that we thought was one of the absolute greatest um, for our country. And I'm not saying he wasn't a great person. I'm just saying that the person versus the policies often are two different things. Well, um, I don't think they're two different things. I think um, it's uh, Roosevelt was a complicated person. Um, but, um, you know, the federal government was not involved in housing until the New Deal. Mm -hmm. So um, it may be that the uh, previous uh, presidents, uh, in the 1920s, Hoover or Harding or Coolidge, the Republican presidents of the 1920s, maybe they would have followed the same policies that um, uh, Roosevelt followed, but they, the, the federal government wasn't involved in housing at that point. The first federal government involvement with housing was in the New Deal, uh, in the Roosevelt administration during the Depression, and it was always segregated. So the, it was the New Deal policies that are largely responsible for the unconstitutional uh, residential segregation that we have today. You know, the very first uh, uh, program uh, of the New Deal was the creation of the Public Works Administration. One of the things that the Public Works Administration did was uh, create the first public housing in this country. There was never any public housing uh, before that. And the public housing that the Public Works Administration created it was for working class, lower middle class families. Uh, we had 25% unemployment rate in the depression. Uh, public housing wasn't for that 25%. It was for the 75% who had jobs, good incomes, stable work histories, um, but who couldn't find housing because there was so little construction going on. Public Works Administration built the first public housing in this country and it segregated it everywhere. Frequently, frequently creating segregation where it hadn't previously existed because we had many, many more integrated neighborhoods in the mid 20th century, early 20th century than we have today. We'd be stunned if we were transported back to that time. Uh, the reason was that the uh, workers uh, didn't have automobiles. They had to live close enough to the factories where they worked so they could either walk or take, take short, short streetcar rides. And the factory district is typically located near a railroad terminal or deep water port so that uh, uh, the factories could get their parts and ship their final products. So, so both black and white workers were living in broadly the same neighborhoods and walking to work or taking, as I say, very short streetcar rides. Well, the Public Works Administration went into many of these neighborhoods, demolished housing and created segregated housing where it hadn't previously existed. You'll be interested in knowing the very, very first public housing project ever built in this country was built in an integrated neighborhood in Atlanta, Georgia. Atlanta had segregated lunch counters, segregated buses, segregated schools, segregated water fountains, you can name it. But it had integrated neighborhoods for the reason that I just described. The very first public works project in this country was built in a neighborhood of Atlanta called the Flats. The, the Public Works Administration demolished housing there built a project for whites only, forcing the African-Americans who were living there to um, find a, a less adequate housing elsewhere, double and triple up with relatives. Um, in, in, um, in my book, I describe the autobiography of uh, Langston Hughes. Uh, perhaps you've read it, it's called The Big C. Um, uh, in his autobiography, the, the great African-American poet and novelist describes how he grew up in an integrated downtown Cleveland neighborhood. That's not how we think of downtown Cleveland today. But um, he grew up in an integrated downtown Cleveland neighborhood. He said his best friend in high school was Polish. Said he dated a Jewish girl in high school. Not surprising, it was an integrated high school in an integrated neighborhood. Public Works Administration demolished housing in that neighborhood to create two separate projects. Mm -hmm. One for whites, one for African Americans. Uh, creating a pattern of segregation with that and other projects in um, the Cleveland area that persists, the segregation patterns exist, persist to this day. Uh, in The Color of Law, I like to talk where I can, and not about Memphis, but about uh, some self-satisfied smug places that think they're better than Memphis. Uh, one of the ones I talk about is uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Maybe you've heard of it. The, the area between Harvard and MIT was a fully integrated neighborhood in the 1930s called the Central Square neighborhood. Public Works Administration demolished integrated housing in that neighborhood, built two separate projects, one for whites, one for African-Americans, creating a pattern of segregation 
uh, that uh, exists to this day. Um, you know, in 1932, and this gets really to your um, uh, mm -hmm. question. In 1932, African Americans did not support Roosevelt for president. They voted overwhelmingly for the Republican candidate, Herbert Hoover. Mm -hmm. because Republicans had a better record exactly. on civil rights than Democrats did. Not a much better record, a little bit better record. Then by 1936, the African American voting population mostly flipped and started to, and voted overwhelmingly for Roosevelt and have continued to be Democrats to this day. And the reason they did so was because segregated housing <clears throat> was better than no housing at all. Prior to that, the government hadn't provided housing for people who needed it. During the Roosevelt New Deal, it provided some housing for African Americans who needed it desperately. Mm -hmm. And the same thing is true of jobs. The government segregated uh, the works project pro uh, progress programs, the work camps, separate camps for blacks, separate camps for whites, but it gave them jobs that they didn't have before, although on a segregated basis. So this history is quite complicated. Uh, the Roosevelt administration was a segregationist administration. It supported segregation and everything it did, but it provided benefits economic benefits for both blacks and whites that they hadn't previously received. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would encourage um, all that are watching as well, CNN is doing this great series on first ladies and they do Eleanor Roosevelt. And to see what Eleanor Roosevelt's impact was on the black community is really, really powerful. Thank you uh, for that. I, I wanna get into this um, discussion of rentals a little bit. Um, in Memphis, the 2008 subprime mortgage crisis really exacerbated um, this whole issue of rentals versus home ownership, with many Black homeowners losing their homes to foreclosure. Uh, the State of Memphis Housing 2020 uh, report notes that those vacancies were ripe for non-owner investors who bought low, creating rentals that were cost prohibitive for so many. The COVID-19 eviction situation that is facing us is poised to really throw fuel on an already burning fire as I see it. Can you draw any parallels between the past and with regard to rentals versus home ownership and what we potentially will be seeing going forward coming out of this COVID-19 uh, circumstance if we ever come out of it? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Terry, that's a complicated question. I'm going to try to break it up into a number of parts. Sure. First, COVID. Uh, COVID is frequently described as a, uh, a, a virus that affects African Americans more than, than whites. And that's not quite accurate. What the COVID does is it affects people who live in overcrowded, dense communities who have to go to work uh, interacting with other people rather than sitting behind a computer at home. It affects people like that more than it affects people who uh, live in less dense communities, less overcrowded conditions, uh, and who can work from home. And of course, uh, African-Americans are disproportionately uh, living in overcrowded conditions and having jobs that require them to leave home. And so they get um, disproportionately ill from the COVID and die from it. Um, the only solution to that is, uh, uh, is to address this issue of housing segregation and the disadvantage of um, poorly resourced neighborhoods in which we've concentrated African-Americans. Uh, so that's uh, that's uh, the first part. Um, uh, what was the first part of your question? I'm sorry. I'm sorry about this whole oh, idea. Okay. Of yes, yes, the subprime, yeah. Yeah, subprime market. There are many policies that we continue to follow today, some of which are racially explicit, others of which are race neutral, but that reinforce segregation. Uh, and uh, once you have a pattern of segregation, you can have race neutral policies that uh, reinforce it uh, because they're building on a pattern that already exists. So uh, in the lead up to the uh, collapse of the housing market in 2008, there were many banks and mortgage brokers who were racially explicit in targeting African-Americans and Hispanic homeowners for uh, racially um, uh, uh, explicit uh, exploitative uh, refinance loans. Uh, the, the refinance loans, uh, uh, one of the banks, and I believe there was a uh, suit in Memphis about this against one of the major national banks mm -hmm. that um, uh, had uh, mortgage brokers and bankers sending out uh, mortgage um, salespeople to black churches on Sundays targeting black churches as a place to sell these exploitative loans. Um, 
selling them and marketing in black neighborhoods, but not in whites, white neighborhoods. The loans that they were marketing had very, very low teaser rates, uh, teaser rates, meaning the low interest rates to begin with. Mm -hmm. And you had to read the fine print to realize that after a couple of years, the, the interest rates would explode into high unaffordable interest rates. And you couldn't get out of the mortgage that, at that point because these, um, they're called subprime loans, um, also had a very, very expensive uh, prepayment penalties. So once you were locked into this loan, believing it was a low interest loan that you could use to take some money out of your home to refinance it, you couldn't get out of it and you could no longer afford the mortgage payments and lost the home. Um, these loans were marketed frequently to African-American and, and Hispanic homeowners who were perfectly eligible for the kinds of normal um, amortized low interest loans that white family family homeowners were, were getting. So this was a, a, a violation of the Fair Housing Act. The government did very, very little to clamp down on it. There were some private suits that the government took over. I believe I say one is in Memphis and was settled uh, with some uh, very small payments. Uh, didn't put African-Americans back in the homes that they had lost as a result of this policy. But there are also many policies that, that we follow that are race neutral, uh, but that reinforce segregation today. I can give you one example um, uh, for rentals uh, that you're talking about. Uh, the biggest program that we have in this country for uh, subsidizing uh, rental apartments for low-income families who are disproportionately African-American and Hispanic in some places um, is something called the Low-Income Housing Tax Credit. I'm sure you're familiar with it. Uh, the Low-Income Housing Tax Credit is a uh, tax credit issued by the U.S. Treasury Department the, then uh, distributed to states, and then states redistribute those tax credits to developers of low-income housing. The U.S. Treasury Department regulations, uh, and you can look them up if you don't believe me, this is absurd. The U.S. Uh, Treasury Department regulations for the low-income housing tax credit places a priority on putting low-income units in existing low-income neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say it's designed as to reinforce segregation, but that's clearly its, uh, its effect. Um, that's crazy. We should have the opposite policy. It's not that we shouldn't put better housing in low-income neighborhoods. Of course we should. Every neighborhood should have better housing. But we should also have a priority in placing housing that's subsidized in high-opportunity communities where low-income families uh, who can, can have um, housing in places, uh, as I said before, where there are good jobs that they can access because there's transportation to get to them where they have uh, supermarkets to sell healthy, healthy food, where they have clean air. Uh, that priority should be reversed. Um, we're not going to reverse it unless we have a new civil rights movement that's as militant as the civil rights movement of the 1960s that makes it uncomfortable to maintain policies like that. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that you say that because I, I, I would contend that we are at the beginning of that movement. Um, that you are speaking of. And um, often it, when we look back, it's so easy to think that, you know, the civil rights movement of the mid 20th century was um, this very peaceful, um, quiet um, movement mm -hmm. uh, because that's the narrative that we hear a lot. And while certainly peaceful protest was a part of the movement, um, we know that a lot of people lost lives during that movement and um, anything that's pushing for change is going to always ruffle some some feathers. So I think it's interesting that you mentioned that. And I think people should also recognize that as we're talking about um, this kind of systemic racism, the tale of systemic racism is very, very long and it permeates basically everything. And it will take a lot of work and effort for us to get out of this. I want to ask a question that I'm going to honestly say that I kind of stole from someone who interviewed you, Ta-Nehisi Coates, <laughs> um, but I'm going to put a little bit of a, a spin on it. You know, um, one of the tactics you talked about in your book was blockbusting and selling acquired properties to African-Americans on installment plans, which sounded to me like the equivalent of sharecropping, um, but in the housing form. This for me raised another issue regarding reparations. Do you think reparations are a reasonable response for the historic inequities created by government in housing? 
Now, Terry, you can't combine six different questions in one little <laughs> thing like that. So let me try that. <laughs> let me try I've been doing it pretty well up until this moment. So I keep yeah. adding more and more questions in one question. Well, let me first, on one point I want to make in, uh, in response to how you led up to that. The civil rights movement in the 1960s was a peaceful movement. The violence came from its opponents. Yes. Uh, John Lewis, whom we spent so much time commemorating uh, this summer, um, he didn't. He wasn't violent. Uh, he was beaten uh, by police. He didn't start any violence. Uh, so uh, uh, the civil rights movement, uh, he said the civil rights movement should make good trouble to uh, uh, call attention and uh, create pressure for reform, for abolishing unconstitutional segregation. But by good trouble, he meant marches and demonstrations and civil disobedience, not violence. Yeah. And we need good trouble again today. Um, so far as uh, uh, reparations goes, uh, there might have been six other questions between those two that I don't remember. But so far as reparations go, uh, I, um, I prefer not to use the term reparations because most people misunderstand it as uh, thinking that reparations is a single payment to the current generation of African-Americans. It would inevitably be a token payment. It would never be enough to uh, compensate for the uh, centuries of um, the legacies of slavery and Jim Crow. If we did make such a payment, um, which would be a great thing to do, but people would conclude, okay, we've now taken care of the problem. If we don't have equality, that's Black's problem. Uh, so I prefer to talk about remedies. Of which some, some of those remedies will involve substantial costs like reparations. Um, one remedy, uh, uh, I can give you this example, is a very narrowly targeted remedy for a very specific constitutional violation that I described earlier, is the government should be buying up homes in these all-white suburbs at current market rates, $300,000, $400,000, $500,000, whatever they are, and reselling them to qualified African Americans for something closer to $100,000. That would be a narrowly targeted remedy for a very specific constitutional violation that would uh, be completely justifiable in terms of the history I've recounted. And let me say something else. As I mentioned earlier, I was an education writer. I'm not a professional historian, uh, but um, every fact that I've recounted to you uh, uh, today uh, and that's in this book uh, has never been challenged. No, a single fact has been challenged by a professional historian. So this is incontrovertible, this history that I'm telling you about. If we forced the courts to recognize, take account of this history, it would be very difficult for them to resist uh, the remedy that I just described, a narrowly targeted affirmative action program in housing. But there are many things that we can do, and this is why I prefer remedies as the, as the term, many things we do that don't cost anything at all. I mentioned a few minutes ago the low-income housing tax credit program doesn't cost anything to change the priorities of that program uh, so that we um, create opportunities for people to live in healthier neighborhoods with more resources. Uh, the the um, Section 8 voucher program is similar. Uh, that program also reinforces segregation mm -hmm. for several reasons. One is that um, landlords won't take, uh, are permitted uh, by law uh, not to accept the, a rental application from some with a Section 8 voucher. There are some communities in this country, some states and a few cities that have uh, prohibited that kind of discrimination, but in most places it's permitted. And the result is that most uh, Section 8 voucher holders have to use their, their vouchers only in existing low-income neighborhoods, reinforcing their segregation. The other reason is that the voucher amount is um, uh, calculated uh, on an area-wide uh, median. Uh, of, of rents in, in an area. And that area-wide median is too low to afford rentals in uh, high opportunity communities uh, and too high to afford rentals in existing low-income segregated neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. uh, the landlords exploit the program in those neighborhoods by charging more than the market uh, uh, requires uh, for rent. We could very easily, without cost, uh, reallocate those funds so that there are higher uh, Section 8 voucher amounts provided for families who use them to move to more higher opportunity places and uh, lower amounts for families who choose to use them in existed segregated uh, neighborhoods. Uh, that would be another no-cost program. Uh, 
uh, that would um, uh, uh, help to redress this problem. The biggest one and the most difficult politically, but also no cost, is we should abolish uh, zoning ordinances hmm. that uh, require only the construction of single family homes on large lot sizes. Those zoning ordinances, which were largely created after the creation of these all white suburbs hmm. as ways of preserving their segregation, should be deemed unconstitutional because they perpetuate an unconstitutionally created situation. So we need a menu of remedies, some of which are costly, uh, some of which are costless, but all of which uh, require a new civil rights movement to demand uh, to force this country to accept, stand up to its um, our constitutional responsibilities to redress uh, unconstitutional segregation that we have today. Mm -hmm. So Richard, we are coming to the end of our um, program. And as we are, are looking at 2020, 2021, and operating within this, um, this arena of COVID impacted communities, let's call it that, <clears throat> COVID impacted communities, what things in particular would you say to the city of Memphis and to the Tennessee Housing Development Authority to really put effort into to help us begin to bridge some of these issues that we see in, you know, we can take Memphis or we can take almost any urban community um, across the country. What, what, what would you say to them? Well, um, most of these programs are, as I said, visionary because there's no political support for them. Uh, far more than good program ideas, we need the new civil rights movement. But I mentioned one, that the uh, reform of the Section 8 um, voucher program would be one thing that the, the Memphis Housing Authority uh, could do. Uh, the city of Memphis uh, could prohibit discrimination against Section 8 voucher holders. But beyond that, I think we ought to be envisioning public housing like we had it, except not segregated, in the 1930s that Roosevelt uh, created public housing, not just for poor people. Uh, you know, middle-class families, working-class families can't afford housing in many communities in this country, uh, especially gentrifying communities that um, where, where teachers, uh, you know, African-Americans disproportionately, teachers, nurses, uh, construction workers, service workers, frequently can't afford to live in the communities that they serve. We need public housing that's high quality, like the public housing that we initially built in the 1930s for families uh, who can afford to pay rent, not who need to be subsidized, that include both subsidized units for low-income families, that include units that perhaps slightly subsidized for the, those workforce uh, families I talked about before, and market rate housing. Mm -hmm. so that we have healthy communities in public housing, not places where we concentrate the poor and um, uh, create uh, social problems that we can't solve, like the problems in schools I talked about before. Okay. Well, I think we have some time for questions. Um, if you will hang around for that, uh, Richard. Um, and if anyone has questions, I would ask them to go ahead and submit them. Um, I don't see any at this point in time. I did. So let me ask another question because you mentioned Section 8. <clears throat> I moved uh, to Memphis uh, six years ago from a community um, outside, well, between Washington, D.C. and Baltimore called Columbia, Maryland. You may have heard of it, uh, designed by James Rouse, um, who really did try to develop equitable housing um, in, in a community. <clears throat> and um, um, one of the things that happened in Baltimore when they were um, eliminating the um, public housing was they were giving people vouchers for the move to opportunity program to bring them into Howard County, Maryland. And one of the things that they were running into was the whole NIMBY piece of this. Can you talk about that a little bit? And I see we do have a question, so I'll follow up with that question. Yes, um, uh, this uh, NIMBY is not in my backyard. Uh, and uh, that's why we need, and I'm, I'm repeating myself, I'm sorry, but that's why we need a new civil rights movement in uh, those communities. Let me give an example, um, if, if I may, and I, I'm going to try not to take too much time, but, uh, but it's hard to, to do this in bullet points. Uh, I gave a talk like this many, well, a year ago almost, um, uh, when I was able to travel in, in um, 
a community not very different from Memphis, Kansas City, uh, yeah. not so far away. Uh, I was uh, I gave a talk like this, and afterwards there was a panel of um, uh, that included the mayor of Kansas City, and we were talking about uh, the zoning ordinances in Kansas City that prevented. Uh, the construction of uh, townhouses or, or uh, garden apartments or even high quality apartments, low level apartment buildings. I said to him, why don't you abolish those zoning ordinances? He said, well, the city council would never approve it. I said, well, how, how many city council people would support it? He said four, maybe five. I asked him, well, how many city council people are there? He said 13. So I did a quick arithmetic. You know, I'm not too good at it, but I did some quick arithmetic. I said, so you only need two more. If you got two more city council people. You could uh, abolish single family zoning in Memphis, in, in Kansas City, rather. And he said, yeah, that's true. So I said, uh, which are the two council districts which would be most likely to flip on this issue? And he said, oh, districts four and district six uh, would be <coughs> subject to pressure. So then I turned to the audience. Uh, it was a live audience, uh, not like a, a Zoom audience like this, but uh, I, I, we could do the same thing in Memphis. And I said, how many of you live in District 4 and District, District 6? About 50 people raised their hands. And I said, well, you need to form a civil rights group in your community to begin a pressure campaign against those two city council people to um, redress uh, the segregation of, of this city. And the, the same thing is true uh, everywhere. Um, there is this YIMBY opposition. Um, there is no opposition to the YIMBYs that's organized. Mm -hmm. That's why we need a new civil rights movement. And you said earlier, Terry, that uh, you were confident about uh, it might be emerging. I'm, I'm hopeful as well. We have a more accurate and passionate discussion about race in this country now than we ever have had before in American history more accurate account of the legacies of slavery and Jim Crow than we've ever had before in American history. We have, um, as you know, uh, better than me, um, we have white elected politicians in the South removing statues that commemorate the defenders of slavery and Jim Crow. That was unheard of just a few years ago. Mm -hmm. We had 25 million Americans participating in the Black Lives Matter demonstration uh, last spring and summer. Uh, of whom most were white, <clears throat> completely unheard of at any point in our past. Uh, my book uh, uh, has a quite stunning reception. I never expected it, but it's not just my book. It's uh, Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow. It's Brian Stevenson's book, Just Mercy. Uh, it's ta Coates's work that you've mentioned. Uh, if you look at the bestseller lists of nonfiction bestseller lists <clears throat> today, you'll find that most of the books are about race. Uh -huh. So we're having a, a, a very passionate and, and intelligent conversation about it. That's a precondition. Right. Um, it's, not the, it's not the result. Yeah. Out of that conversation, we need people organizing like those people in Kansas City that I talked about. Exactly. And I think the outcomes that we have to kind of focus on. Okay, we had a question. Can you expound on the forgotten middle class? Yes. <clears throat> As I mentioned, I... Uh, when we first built public housing, for example, it was for working class, lower middle class families. It was not for the poor. Uh, it became a program for the poor only after that program that I described before, where white middle class uh, families were moved out of public housing into single family homes in the suburbs as a result of this unconstitutional program of the Federal Housing Authority and Veterans Administration. And then at about the same time, the jobs disappeared from those areas because factories no longer needed to be located near deep water ports and railroad terminals. They could move out to rural areas and to suburbs and ship their products and get their parts by truck. So when the jobs disappeared, the African-Americans who are now remaining in the cities after the whites had been moved out by this federal policy could no longer afford uh, the rent uh, in public housing, which was the full rent. It was not subsidized. The government had to begin subsidizing it at, Public housing became predominantly African-American. Um, once it began subsidizing it, it stopped investing in it, uh, stopped maintaining it, uh, and uh, the projects deteriorated, became urban slums uh, that we became familiar with uh, with public housing. But we should recreate the model that we had earlier, except with the, for the segregation aspect. We should be creating housing 
for the low income families that includes also units for middle class families what the, your questioner called the forgotten middle class whom i said cannot afford housing at market rates in many parts of this country today in most, the most desirable parts of this country uh, as well as market rate the uh, units which can help to support the subsidies that the public housing uh, should provide that's not politically practical today but it should be um, and uh, we have a system where we have two kinds of housing. We have market rate housing for the affluent, and we have subsidized housing with LIHTC, the low income housing tax credit, and Section 8 for the very poor. And nobody in between. Uh -huh. uh, nothing in between. We have no programs to support their housing. Uh, teachers, just, just take an example, teachers in Memphis uh, don't earn enough to afford market rate housing in many of the healthiest neighborhoods uh, around Memphis and even in Memphis as it uh, begins to gentrify um, and earn too much to qualify for subsidies in the low income house, housing tax credit and section eight. Yeah. So it's the missing middle. Uh, yeah. You call, I call it the missing middle. It's uh, the forgotten middle class. And we need a housing uh, program that covers, um, that provides housing for people at all income levels. So those who can afford to pay the full cost and those who can't even if they're not poor. So we have another question on the screen. If you advocate getting rid of residential zoning, what do you suggest it is replaced with? And would the replacement continue to empower home ownership, not just rental? Oh, I'm not opposed to residential zoning. Uh, we should certainly have residential zoning. What we shouldn't have is zoning that only permits one kind of residence, which is single family homes and frequently on large lot sizes. We should have zoning that prohibits an industry and polluting uh, industries and large commercial uh, uh, the projects in um, uh, in residential neighborhoods. There's nothing, I, I'm not opposed to that. But we should, and, and, and the zoning that we should have should permit a variety of housing types. Home ownership, yes. Uh, ADUs, yes. Uh, garden apartments, yes. Um, uh, condominiums, yes. And subsidized units for low-income families. We should have them all, every neighborhood. Uh, to be healthy, should have um, diverse types of, um, of residences so that we can become, uh, uh, have a common society. We can develop a common national identity, as I said earlier, so that people can get to know each other and live with, with one another. Uh, what we're now doing is creating, um, creating segregation with our zoning, uh, and we can't preserve this democracy if we do. Okay, the, the next question that popped up has to do with the Great Society programs from Johnson um, and how those programs affect housing post uh, FDR. Well, uh, the, um, you know, the, the subtitle of my book, let me say, the subtitle of my book is A Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America. There's nothing hidden about it. Uh, during the Johnson era, during the Nixon era, uh, we all knew this history. We all knew that uh, racial segregation had been created by government. Uh, the Johnson administration had a number of programs, model cities, for example, that were designed to create housing opportunities for African Americans <clears throat> in particular in um, a suburban uh, white communities. Uh, those uh, proposals were deleted in the congressional debates over model cities. And so the only thing that remained in model cities was attempts which have failed over and over again to improve the quality of uh, neighborhoods where we concentrate the most disadvantaged families. Um, <clears throat> if I may, uh, uh, I think I probably can because you don't have a whole lot of questions. So let me tell you a story. Sure. Uh, you know, as I say, Johnson uh, had a number of commissions that recommended uh, the uh, desegregation of suburbs. When he lost his election to Richard Nixon, Richard Nixon appointed as Secretary of Housing and Urban Development a fellow named George Romney. Uh, you may recognize the, the last name, uh, the father of the current uh, senator from Utah, former presidential candidate. Romney, as Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, announced that the federal government had created a white noose around black neighborhoods everywhere in the country, and it was the federal government's obligation to untie that noose. And he proposed a program that was similar to what was proposed in um, the Johnson administration, but he actually implemented it. 
It was called Open Communities. And the Open Communities program of uh, George Romney was one that uh, proposed to withhold federal funds, particularly community development block grant funds, from any community, any suburb that refused to desegregate, that refused to accept uh, housing for African Americans, public housing, uh, uh, low income subsidized housing. He actually withheld held, uh, federal funds from three suburban communities. One, uh, Terry, you're familiar with, suburban Baltimore County. Mm -hmm. He withheld funds from Warren, Michigan. He withheld funds from, funds from a suburban area near Cleveland. Uh, and there was such an uproar among uh, what you call NIMBYs uh, that uh, President Nixon uh, canceled the Open Communities Project, uh, forced Romney out as Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, and canceled uh, the, the program. And we've had nothing uh, so aggressive since to try to redress uh, the segregation of this country. In the Obama administration, we adopted something I know you're all familiar with, the Affordably Furthering Fair Housing Program, which required, it was a, a poor shadow of what George Romney had done. It did threaten to uh, withhold funds from communities that uh, perpetuated their segregation, but only after many years of study and uh, it would have happened long after the Obama administration left office, uh, no funds were ever withheld from any suburb for maintaining its segregation. So uh, I, I wanna emphasize again, we know what to do. What's missing is not knowing what to do. What's missing is a new civil rights movement that's going to force us to do it and in which all of us have an obligation to participate. Mm -hmm. I don't see any additional questions from our audience. Here we go. Opportunity zones are supposed to address some of these underserved areas. Do you think this is an effective way of rebuilding or repurposing previously underserved or undesired areas? Uh, no, I don't. Um, the Opportunity Zones is just a new name for a policy that we've tried to implement for s almost 60 years now. Uh, I mentioned one, the Model Cities program. That was like a model, that was like an Opportunity Zones program to direct investment and programs to existing low-income segregated neighborhoods. We had Enterprise Zones, which gave tax breaks and job training programs to uh, existing low-income segregated neighborhoods. And now we've had Opportunity Zones. Opportunity Zones is actually a a more corrupt program and design than either the even the um, enterprise zones or or model cities because the opportunity zones are um, defined in such a large area that they get eligible for tax breaks if they include uh, low income neighborhoods, but they include a lot more than low income neighborhoods. And I'm sure you've read the stories of people who get tax breaks for allegedly helping low income neighborhoods by building sports stadiums and other. Um, investment in, in high income areas of an opportunity zone that qualify only because there are low income areas within that broad zone as well. Uh, I am certainly in favor of anything we can do to increase investment in uh, low income segregated neighborhoods, but we have a fantasy about it. We somehow think that if we were successful and we've never have been uh, in investing in low-income segregated neighborhoods like opportunity zones or enterprise zones or the low-income housing tax credit that I described, that somehow will create healthy segregated neighborhoods that will remain African-American. Uh, that's a, a, an oxymoron, as they say. It's a contradiction in terms. Uh, if a neighborhood becomes healthy, if we ever succeeded investing enough, investing enough in low-income segregated neighborhoods to make those healthier neighborhoods, Whites would move in, middle-class families would move in. Uh, you can't, separate but equal doesn't work any better in housing than it does in schools. Mm -hmm. And so we have a choice. We, if we want to preserve segregated neighborhoods, we have to keep them poorly resourced worse than low income. If we want to improve the resources and the incomes of families in those neighborhoods, we have to accept the fact that they're going to desegregate. And the problem we face is that then gentrification sets in and many of the families who lived in those neighborhoods get displaced. Uh -huh. Again, we know how to prevent that from happening. We know how to preserve healthy gentrification. We should have rigorous rent control uh, that uh, permits landlords to raise rents by inflationary, uh, according to inflation, but not above that. Uh 
So uh, families aren't forced to leave the homes they've uh, worked for years um, because they uh, can no longer afford the rents. We should have limits on condominium conversions in those neighborhoods. We should have inclusionary zoning programs that require any new developments to have a share of units, uh, both for low income and, as I talked before, for middle income, missing middle families. Uh, and we should have something else, which uh, is uh, has been proposed by a, a former uh, IRS commissioner. It's uh, John Koskinen, the Koskinen Plan. And uh, it's um, it says that we should freeze property taxes for existing homeowners in a, a community. So, for example, um, if uh, you have a, a neighborhood, a low-income neighborhood that uh, may be subject to gentrification because there is new investment in that community, and you have a homeowner, for example, who's lived in that community for 30 years and bought a home, uh, say, 50, uh, 30 years ago for $50,000 uh, and now sells the home uh, until uh, for the period that she owns the home, she pays property taxes at the $50,000 rate. Mm -hmm. But then when she sells the home for $300,000, the lost property taxes are returned to the treasury so that the schools don't suffer from a property tax freeze, so that the fire departments and the libraries don't suffer from a property tax freeze. And so the homeowner, if she sells the home for, what did I say, $300,000? Uh -huh. Instead of making a $250,000 profit, she only makes a $200,000 profit because of the return of the lost property taxes. So uh -huh. these are the kinds of policies that we should follow if we were serious about um, improving the resources in uh, those communities but we're not doing it. And yep. we're not doing it because we don't have a civil rights movement that's forcing us to do it. Yeah, I think your comment uh, saying that uh, separate but equal doesn't work in housing any better than it did in education and separate is never equal um, <clears throat> is, is what I found. I think we have two questions left. This one is what are your thoughts about addressing these issues as a human rights issue as opposed to a civil rights issue? Well, of course, they are human rights issues, but I, I focus on them as civil rights issues because in addition to being the right thing to do, the policies that I'm talking about are a constitutional obligation. The segregation that we have today was created in violation of the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments to the Constitution. And so by framing in that way, I'm calling attention to the fact not just that it's a good thing to do for human rights reasons, to um, improve the conditions of, of African-Americans in this country, but it's an obligation that we all have as American citizens. And uh, so calling it a civil rights issue adds that obligatory uh, aspect to it uh, because the segregation that we have is unconstitutional, not just wrong, not just in I think we have one final question that is going to pop up on the screen, I think. <laughs> this is the beauty of, um, of, of virtual. Well, if we do not have another question, I will come. Oh, here we go. Where have NIMBYs been overturned successfully? Oh, that's a great question. <clears throat> well, I'm going to broaden that question because there are many, many places where we have successfully implemented small programs to redress this. I don't want to suggest that we've done nothing, that no place has done anything. As you probably know, of talking about NIMBYs, uh, the city of Minneapolis abolished single family zoning throughout the entire city uh, uh, a couple of years ago. That's a first step. It's not going to solve this problem because, uh, as I said earlier, in addition uh, to abolishing single family zoning, uh, what we need is uh, policies that will subsidize uh, housing for African Americans so they can move to uh, better resource neighborhoods, um, even if. Uh, townhouses or garden apartments or high quality apartments are being constructed in those neighborhoods. But that's an example of a, uh, where NIMBYs were defeated. Uh, there are other examples of uh, places where we've made progress. There are some uh, places uh, that have uh, very small subsidies for missing middle housing, locally raised uh, through bond issues. Uh, that would be another example of places that have made progress on this issue. There are places that have uh, reformed um, their Section 8 programs. Uh, you mentioned uh, before, Terry, uh, Baltimore. Mm -hmm. uh, that actually was done as a result of a lawsuit, a right. civil rights suit, uh, where civil rights uh, lawyers uh, sued uh, the federal government and the Baltimore Housing Authority uh, 
for uh, creating segregated uh, housing projects for African Americans in African American neighborhoods. And part of the settlement of that suit was to enhance the amount of vouchers for uh, former public housing residents of Section 8 vouchers that would permit them to uh, move to higher opportunity neighborhoods and gave them support uh, in terms of counseling and advice and help in finding apartments uh, in better neighborhoods. Uh, there are other places that have done similar things, uh, like um, uh, uh, Chicago has, has a program, uh, uh, Milwaukee has a program. So uh, there are a number of places that have tried to reform the Section 8 programs in those ways. There are some places that have done a better job in placing low-income housing tax credit developments in higher opportunity communities, despite the Treasury Department regulation, which is not binding. Uh, and they can override it. Uh, the state can override it with a what's called a quality uh, qualified allocation plan. Um, uh, there was a lawsuit, a, a Supreme Court suit in 2015. The Supreme Court issued a decision that said that uh, placing a, a disproportionate share of low-income housing tax credit units in low-income segregated neighborhoods could be a violation of the Fair Housing Act uh, because it had a disparate impact was the legal term. Uh, on African American communities. And as a result of that decision, um, uh, the uh, Texas and the, the city of Dallas began to place a few more of their projects than they had previously done in higher opportunity communities. Mm -hmm. There are places that have inclusionary zoning rules. Uh, again, the, they're, they're um, inadequate because they, they typically uh, require only the provision of low income units uh, in market rate developments, not the missing middle. And that's uh, unhealthy for a number of reasons. Not only does not address the housing crisis for workforce families, but mixing the highest income and the lowest income families together with nobody in between is not a, a formula for social harmony. So I think it's not a good idea for that reason, but it's a step in, in, in the right direction. So there are many examples around the country of people who are trying to, to make a difference with these policies and some places that have succeeded in small ways. Well, Richard, thank you so much for being with us today. I think this was a fascinating conversation. It's been my honor and privilege to be able to talk with you about this book that I think is really must read uh, information for people uh, in the realm of historic information. Often we think we're talking some far distant land that has no relevance to us today. And in fact, <clears throat> most history has direct impact on us today. And your book certainly um, does demonstrate that. So thank you again for being with us. And I think now we're gonna go to Mary. Thank you very much. Thank you, Terry. Again, I'm Mari Albertson. Um, that was such a great session. Um, we really thank the speakers. And Terry, I always love listening to you speak and, and lead a conversation. So I know um, from reading the comments in the chat, there was some just great participation and everybody was really engaged in that session. So thank you again for your time today. Um, we're going to play a short video and um, Hope everyone is enjoying these and then um, enjoy the platform at 145. We will reconvene in our breakout session. So be looking at the agenda and picking your session out and we will see you in the breakout. Thanks again.